Aloha and welcome to Armed and Dangerous, a talk about analyzing ARM64 malware targeting macOS. My name is Patrick Wardle. I am the creator of the Objective-C tool suite and Mac security website, the organizer of the Objective by the Sea macOS security conference, and also the author of the, the Art of Mac Malware analysis book. So today we're gonna to be talking about analyzing M1 malware, that is, ARM64 malware targeting macOS. After covering some introductory topics, we're gonna to talk about finding such malware to analyze. Now, before we can dive into reverse engineering and disassembling such malware, we need to understand ARM64, the, the instruction set such malware decompiles and disassembles into. Finally, we'll apply our now understanding of ARM64 to analyze some M1 malware. So first, let's cover some introductory topics. Now, this should really be no surprise to anybody, but Mac OS, Macs, are becoming ever more prevalent, ever more popular. And this unfortunately means so too is malware targeting this platform, right? As any technology becomes more prevalent, more popular, malicious code targeting it does as well. Now, there are various reasons why Macs are becoming ever more popular, but one of the main reasons is Apple's new M1 chip. Even the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, has noted this as really one of the driving factors and the reason behind Mac OS's and Mac's really uh, almost explosive growth, especially in the enterprise. So what is M1 or Apple Silicon? Well, it's an ARM-based system on a chip or SOC. The system on a chip combines multiple technologies on a single chip. So for example, in the M1, it's got CPU, GPU, and various memories as well, Again, all on one chip. Now, in the context of malware analysis, in the context of this presentation today, the most important thing to know is that it runs, or the CPU supports an ARM-based instruction set, specifically ARM64, which means any malware that's been compiled to run natively on this system is going to disassemble into these instructions. I also briefly want to talk about Rosetta, which is the translation technology that Apple employs so that legacy Intel applications can still run even on these M1 Apple Silicon systems. Now, as Apple notes, as Apple points out, this is really not a substitute for creating a native version of an application. And there's a few reasons for this. First and foremost, anytime a legacy application is run and Rosetta kind of jumps in the way and translates it, that's gonna take some amount of time. So there's definitely a, a minor performance hit. There's gonna be some slowdown. Also, Rosetta has had a few hiccups and there's some translations that it, it did and maybe still does struggle with that result in uh, crashes, less than ideal. Now, why are we even talking about M1 malware? Well, three main reasons. First, it's inevitable. Obviously, malware authors are going to either recompile their existing malware, or as they're creating new malware, they're gonna compile it so it runs natively on Apple's M1 systems. This is so they don't have to worry about any Rosetta issues, and also so that you know they don't have any speed performance or issues. Also, and this is, Interesting to me, at least, uh, I took a piece of malware that had been built, compiled for both Intel and ARM platforms, uh, uploaded it to Virus Total, and observed the fact that even though the malware was logically equivalent, 100% the same, uh, the ARM variant was detected about 10% less than the Intel version, uh, which to me shows that there's some discrepancy in the way that antivirus signatures are detecting such code. So that's something to be aware of, something problematic, you know, we should really make sure that our AV signatures are architecturally agnostic. Finally, most important for this presentation is the fact that, as I noted, malicious code that has been compiled to natively run on Apple Silicon will disassemble into ARM instructions. So we must have an understanding of this instruction set in order to comprehensively understand these threats. So, now let's talk about uncovering or hunting for M1 malware in the wild, because before we can analyze some specimens, well, we gotta find some, right? So the first question is, how do we 
identify natively compiled M1 code, a binary that can run natively on Apple Silicon. Well, in short, it's gonna be a Mac binary, obviously, that contains ARM64 or ARM64E code. And we can determine this pretty easily. For example, we can use the file utility to show the architectures that a binary supports. So for example, when we run it on Apple's calculator application, we can see that this is a universal binary containing code that will run both natively on Intel and ARM. This is likely what you'll see even in malware because it ensures that native compatibility is retained on both Intel and ARM based systems. Now we also wanna ensure that the binary is designed for Mac OS because iOS also supports ARM. You can use the O tool command and look for load commands within the binary that specify the platform it was built for. Here, for example, we can see calculator.app was built to run on Mac OS. Now, to hunt for N1, M1 malware, I decided to pop onto VirusTotal and earlier this year, perform a search to see if there was any Mac malware that would natively target Apple Silicon in the wild. So here we can see my search query. In short, I leveraged VirusTotal's search tags to tell it to only look for Mac OS universal binaries that contained 64-bit code. I went one step further and said I only am interested in malware or files that have been flagged by at least two antivirus products. The idea was I simply wanted to find any Mac malware, even if it was existing Intel, Intel based malware that had been recompiled to run natively on Apple's new M1 systems. This query resulted in a single candidate file, a binary named go search 22. Using the file and the O tool commands, I could confirm that indeed it was a macOS application binary that had ARM64 code. In other words, it had been compiled to natively run on Apple Silicon. In terms of answering the question, was it malicious or not? As I mentioned, a few antivirus products already had flagged it, plus Apple had actually already revoked its certificate. Continuing analysis confirmed that yes, indeed it was malicious and it turned out to be a new variant of the very prolific Mac malware family, Pirate. So hooray, we've uncovered which, what was the first publicly known instance of malware natively compiled to run on Apple Silicon in the wild. Now, before we can dive into it to reverse engineer it, we need to gain at least a fundamental understanding of ARM64. This is again, the instruction set that such malware will disassemble into. Before we dive into instructions and registers and mnemonics and operands, I want to you know, call out some really helpful, helpful resources, uh, first and foremost, that really helped me gain an understanding of this instruction set, but also to put them on a slide in case after this talk, you want to dive deeper into ARM64. So take a look. Um, these are great, super helpful, awesome book, and the ones listed below are available online for free. So first up, we have registers. Uh, if you've done any reverse engineering, you're probably familiar with registers. They're basically temporary storage slots on the CPU that can be referenced via name. I like to think of them somewhat as you know, synonymous to variables in a high-level programming language. Now, ARM64 supports 31 64-bit general purpose registers named X0 through X30. You can also refer to the lower 32-bit components of these registers with the W prefix. So for example, if you want to refer to the lower 32 bits of the X0 register, you do that via W0. And you will see this occasionally in disassemblies, especially when it's referencing 32-bit integers, for example. Now ARM also supports several specific purpose registers, such as the stack pointer and the program counter. It also has a virtual register, the zero register, which its value is always set to zero. Finally, it has an entity called the processor state. This is not a register per se, but it does have condition flags that instructions can indirectly set and that then subsequent instructions can conditionally check to perform conditional executions. Uh, so in some, some sense, you can think of it as a flags register. 
We'll dive into that more later. Now, in the context of a function call, which is very important when you're analyzing malicious code, is to gain an understanding of how registers are used. This is defined in something called an application binary interface, or ABI. And for ARM64 on Mac OS, these are the following rules. The eight registers, the initial eight arguments passed to a function to a function will be found in x0 through x7. So the first argument, arg0, is going to found, be found in x0, second one in, arg, uh, in x1, et cetera, et cetera. In the context of the function, the stack frame pointer will be found in x29, or the fp frame pointer register. The return address will be stored in the x30 register, which is also referred to as the link register, or lr. Finally, when the function returns, its return value will be found in the x0 register, or if it's a 128-bit value, it'll be also found in the x1 register. Next up, we have instructions. Instructions instruct the CPU what to do. They basically map a specific sequence of bytes to tell the CPU to perform a specific operation. Instructions start with something known as a mnemonic. And this is a human readable abbreviation that kind of maps to the operation the instruction performs. So for example, on the slide, we have an add instruction. The mnemonic is add and it performs addition. Easy peasy, right? Following the mnemonic are operands. Operands come in three types. The first is a constant or an immediate type. Uh, this is things like constant numbers, 42. The second type are register operands, and these are one of the aforementioned registers, x1, x0, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, you can have memory operands, which are register values that point to a memory address. You can think of them as pointers. And as we'll see, it's the register with brackets around it. One other thing to point out is that instructions, the first operand is usually the destination register. So on the slide, we have add x1, x0, 42. What this does is tell the CPU to take the value of 42, add it to the x0 register, and then save or store that in x1. X1 is, again, the first operand. It is the destination that will have the result of the action. In this case, the addition. We also need to talk about ARM's memory access model. It is based on something called load and store. What happens is there are specific instructions designed for memory access. So for example, you have instructions that are capable of loading data from memory into registers. Then the majority of other instructions will perform all sorts of operations, additions, bitwise ORs, et cetera, et cetera. Once those instructions are done operating on the contents of memory, which has now been moved into a register, it will be saved to memory via the store command. Let's look at this a little closer. So the way that data is loaded from memory into the register on ARM64 is via the LDR instruction or one of its variants. As the animation showed, it's going to grab something from memory and move it into a register. If we look at the instruction on the slide, we see LDR, load, x1, and then x0. Again, x0 has brackets around it, which delineate as a pointer to memory. So what the CPU does is it will dereference the value in x0 and load it into the x1 register. Again, x1 being the first operand, the destination register. I've also added the analogous C statement to the slide to kind of help with some understanding as well. All right, so now let's talk about the store instruction, or STR. The store instruction, as the animation shows, stores something from a register into a specified memory address. It's important, though, to understand that unlike the majority of other instructions, the first operand is actually the source register. So on the slide, we have str, store, x1, and then x0 in brackets. The CPU will take the value 
in X1 and store it at the memory address specified in X0. Again, analogous C instruction might be a little more illustrative as well. We also need to talk about conditions. A lot of times malware will perform some action, query its environment, and then based on that query or that observation, perform some conditional action, which may impact our analysis. Therefore, it's, it's, it's important to understand how conditions and conditional executions occur in ARM64. So we have the compare instruction, CMP, which as its name implies, performs a comparison between two operands. Specifically though, it subtracts the two operands, discards the subtraction result, but then updates the flags in the P state or processor state entity. So we have the instruction CMP X042. If X0 equals 42, the subtraction of 42 minus 42 will equal zero, which means the zero flag will be set in the processor state. Now, once the condition flags have been set, for example, by the compare instruction, subsequent instructions will act on these flags via condition codes. Uh, and these condition codes are things like equal, not equal, less than, greater than, things that you would expect. So here we have an example. Uh, this is code from uh, an M1 malware sample, and it is invoking a function to check if it is running in a debugger. As we'll see, this is kind of a standard anti-analysis check. What the disassemble instructions do once the function returns is check the return value. Again, the return value is going to be an x0 or w0. So we see a compare instruction checking to see if this value was 1. This will set the 0 flag if and only if the function returned 1 or true. Below that, we see a b.any instruction. That is a branch not equal. We'll talk about branches on the next slide, but for now, think of it almost as a conditional jump instruction. What this will do is it will take the jump if and only if the comparison was not true, right? That's what the dot any in the branch instruction uh, means. So if we look at this disassembly snippet again, we can see that if the malware is not being debugged, it will continue operation as expected. But if the am I being debugged bugged function returns a one or a true, the conditional branch will not be taken. And if we look below, we can see the malware will then execute an instruction which causes it to prematurely exit. Let's look a little closer at branches, which alter control flow of a program. There's three types. The first is an unconditional branch, and this will jump to a specified uh, memory address or value in a register unconditionally. You can think about this uh, similar to a, a jump in a you know the Intel instruction set. The second type is the conditional. Uh, branch. We saw that on the previous slide. And this will jump, this will branch if and only if the condition is fulfilled. If not, it's essentially a no op, the branch will not be taken. Finally, we have the BL or BLR instruction, which stands for branch and link. And this is how calls are performed in ARM64 instructions. So what this will do behind the scenes is first store the address of the next instruction in the X30 or the link register. It will then jump to the specified address, which is going to be a function, execute the function. And then when a return instruction is executed behind the scenes, the return instruction will read the value that has been stored in the link register and jump back to it, returning control flow back to the caller. So now we have you know, a basic understanding of ARM64 instructions. Let's now walk through reverse engineering fully a compiled M1 binary using the quintessential hello world. On the top of the slide, we have the Objective-C source code. This is what gets compiled into the M1 binary. On the other side, we have the ARM64 disassembly. Now, before we dive into the disassembly, one point, the auto release block in the Objective-C source code is going to get compiled into a pool push and pool pop function call. We'll see this in the disassembly, so just be aware of that fact. 
First up, we have what is known as a function prologue. Function prologues are not specific to ARM64. You've probably encountered them when reversing other binaries. And their job is basically to adjust the stack pointer to make space for local variables in the function. Function prologues can also store various registers that need to be maintained across function calls. Um, and then, you know, you often see initialization of local var variables. That is exactly what happens here. We see via the sub instruction that hex 30 is subtracted from the stack pointer. Via the STP or store pair instruction, the CPU will store a pair of registers, x29 and x30 onto the stack. It then adjusts the frame pointer and saves some other registers and initializes some other local variables. We then encounter the first call to a function. Uh, and this is a branch to the pool push API function. As we mentioned, it's gonna use the BL or the branch link instruction, which remember will first store the address of the next instruction in the link register so that when the function is done, it can return back and control flow can continue. Now this function doesn't take any parameters, so there's no registers that have to be initialized with arguments. But I do wanna point out that this function does return a value, specifically a pool object. The code wants to save this. So we can see in the highlighted instruction, it stores the value found in x0, remembering x0 holds the return value from a function into uh, or onto the stack. So now the pool object has been saved. Then we see a call to the nslog function. We start at the bottom, we see nslog is invoked with the bl instruction, no surprises here. However, the nslog function takes a single parameter, so this argument has to be initialized. So if we look back in the disassembly, we can see the disassembly building the address to the hello world string object, and then it is moved into the x0 register via the move instruction. Again, recalling that the first argument is always gonna be found in x0. Next up, we see another function call, this time to the pool pop object, uh, function rather. And this function also takes a parameter, which means that x0 is going to have to be reinitialized with the parameter this function expects, which is the pool object that was previously returned by the pool push function. So the way this register is initialized is via the LDR instruction because recall the pool object was stored on the stack. So again, ARM is this load store architecture. So it was previously stored. So now the load instruction will load it from the stack into the X0 register. Once that's been initialized, the function call can be made via the BL instruction. Finally, we have the function epilogue. This restores the two registers that were saved to the stack. Um, it then readjusts the stack and then finally returns to the caller. As we mentioned, the return instruction will pop or read the address stored in the x30 or link register and jump back to it. Uh, also should point out that the function epilogue also initializes the return value so that when the main function returns, its caller can you know, examine its value. Phew! That was a whirlwind kind of tour of the ARM64 instruction set. And if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, that is okay. Why? Well, normally you really don't have to dive that deeply into a binary and understand every last ARM64 assembly instruction. And that's a good thing, because you know who is time for that, right? And there's two reasons why we don't generally have to care about this as much. Uh, the first is that decompilers do a great job of reconstructing a representation of the almost original source code from a binary. On the slide, we can see the decompilation of the hello world binary. And wow, yeah, it looks impressively close to the original source code. We can also leverage dynamic analysis tools when analyzing malware to uncover persistence, capabilities, functionalities, often by simply just running the malware and observing what it does passively. Here's another malicious sample run in conjunction with a file monitor, and we can see we've trivially been able to uncover its persistence mechanism. So you might be thinking, wait, Patrick, does, does this mean I don't have to you know, learn any ARM64? 
I wish, we wish, right? Malware authors unfortunately realize how powerful both decompilers and dynamic analysis tools are, so they add anti-analysis logic into their malicious creations to thwart such tools. So as we'll see, malware often queries its environment to say, hey, am I being debugged? Or hey, am I running in an analysis system or a virtual machine? And if so, exit. So before we can run these dynamic analysis tools, which will answer many of the questions which we seek about the functionality and capability of the malware, we often first have to identify the anti-analysis logic by reading the ARM64 instructions found in the disassembly. The good news is once we have uh, identified these instructions, we can trivially bypass them and then fall back to these more complex or powerful, let's say, uh, dynamic analysis tools. I also want to point out that Ghost Search 22 also contains static analysis obfuscations, which kind of make decompilation almost useless. So there's a few screenshots on the slide of me attempting to decompile Ghost Search 22. And we can see, you know, there's just garbage instructions, spurious function calls. So really, the only option for us is to, you know, roll up our sleeves and really dive into the ARM64 disassembly to uncover the anti-analysis logic. So let's do that now. Uh, it's, you know, I think interesting and also allow us to apply some of the concepts we've just talked about. So if you run Go Search 22 in a debugger, which is something you often do when ma analyzing malware, it will prematurely exit, which is problematic because obviously you want to have the malware continue executing so that you can continue your analysis. So what gives? Clearly the malware is somehow detecting that a debugger is running and prematurely exiting or terminating. So here are five uh, ARM64 assembly instructions that are responsible for GoSearch 22's anti-debugging logic. And we'll go through each of them. So first we see four move instructions. And if we look closely, we can see it's initializing the X0 through X3 registers. Immediately below that is a SVC instruction, which is a supervisor or system call instruction, kind of like an int 80 on Intel platforms. If we read up a little bit more about the supervisor call, we see that it expects a system function, a system call, you know, uh, to execute, and then any parameters that that specific system call or supervisor call expects. We look back in the disassembly, we see that X0, which is going to contain the first argument, is initialized with the value of hex 1a. We Google that, that turns out to be sys ptrace, or the number representing the ptrace system call. The second parameter, which we can find in X1, is initialized with hex 1f. Reading up on the ptrace system call, we see that this is the flag that gets passed to it and 1f maps to the pt deny attach flag. This flag tells the operating system to terminate the process if it's currently being debugging and also prevent any other future attachments by a debugger. So basically this is go search 22's anti-analysis uh, logic. So now we have identified this logic by reading the disassembly and understanding the ARM64 instructions. We obviously want to bypass it so that our analysis can continue. Well, the good news is this is pretty easy against, uh, since again, we, we've just identified the, the logic. What we can do is we can simply set a breakpoint on the supervisor call instruction in the debugger. And then when that breakpoint is hit right before the supervisor call instruction is executed, we simply modify the instruction pointer, the PC register, to actually point to the next instruction. And we can do that via the reg write debugger command. This has the effect of simply skipping the supervisor call. This will therefore skip the anti-debugging logic and the malware is none the wiser. That's awesome. Unfortunately, I continued executing the malware and it still prematurely terminated. So I dug into this deeper looking at the disassembly and eventually I found this line of code that executed something that would 
eventually result in the malware prematurely exiting. Unfortunately, though we can understand what the instructions are doing, we can't really get a ton of information. They're not that informative. Meaning we can see that there's a BLR or branch link register instruction that's going to branch to whatever is in the X8 register. But from the disassembly, we cannot see what's in the X8 register. Good news is, since we've bypassed the anti-debugging logic, we can simply set a breakpoint on this function call and then introspect the values of the registers. So that's exactly what we do. And we can see when we print out the value of X8, which is where the code is going to jump or branch to, we can see it's the obj C message, uh, message send function. That is the method that any Objective-C call is routed through. Apple has documented this, so we can go read up on it. And we can see that its first argument is a pointer to an Objective-C object. And the second parameter, the second argument, is going to be the method that is about to be invoked. So since we set a breakpoint on this function call, we can examine the values of both the object and the method. And we can see in, our, in the debugger that it's an NS task object and the method that's about to be executed is the launch method. We can read up then on the NS task object and its methods. Uh, we can see it's kind of an Objective-C abstraction of an execution context. Um, and the launch method is to you know, kick off or execute uh, you know, a command or a program, much like a, an exec v call, right? We also see that the NS task object has various properties, specifically a launch path and an arguments property that we can query in the debugger to see what this NS task was initialized with. We can see on the slide, its launch path has been set to bin slash, slash sh, which is the shell. And we can see that its arguments are going to execute the CSR util command with the status flag. This is a built-in macOS utility, a command that will return the SIP status, the system integrity protection status. Why is it checking the system integrity protection status? Well, a lot of times analysts, including myself, will turn this off when debugging a sample because it's just easier to introspect and to debug a system when system integrity protection is turned off. So the malware is rightfully saying, hey, if I detect system integrity protection is off, I'm probably running on an analysis machine, so I'm going to prematurely exit. That's exactly what Go Search 22 did. Again, we can trivially bypass this now that we have identified this by setting a breakpoint on this call, and then when that breakpoint is hit, just changing the PC, the instruction pointer register, to point to the next instruction, which has the effect of skipping the call, and the anti-analysis logic is bypassed. Finally, the malware also employs some virtual machine detection. This similarly goes through another obj message send call. Uh, but again, we can use the same trick of setting a breakpoint, examining what it's going to execute, and skipping over that after we understand it. We do that here, we can see that again, it's executing NS task launch. This time though, it's executing a kind of a large script that's looking for artifacts from various virtualization products. If the malware finds any of these, it's going to prematurely exit. So that wraps up GoSearch 22's anti-analysis logic. Since we've identified it all and bypassed it all, we can now kind of return to our normal malware analysis approaches using dynamic analysis tools. That's awesome. So let's wrap up the talk, all right? We don't have time to kind of to, to get into that uh, comprehensive analysis. But again, the point is we really don't need a, a lot of information about ARM64 at that point because we can leverage now you know, dynamic analysis tools because we have identified and bypassed the uh, anti-analysis logic. So first key takeaway, M1 malware is here to stay. This is totally unsurprising. Obviously, malware authors are going to recompile their code or as they're building new creations, compile them to run natively on Apple Silicon. 
We talked a little bit about hunting M1 malware. Uh, interestingly enough, if you take that uh, search query that I mentioned earlier and go to virus total today, you'll see it now detects a myriad of you know more malware. There's there's new malware out there that has been compiled to run natively on the M1 systems. The core of the talk really introduced some key components, some foundational components about the ARM64 instruction set, which is the instruction set this malware disassembles to. Finally, we applied some of that understanding, some of that knowledge to uncover GoSearch 22's anti-analysis logic, which allowed us to then bypass that anti-analysis logic so that dynamic analysis of the malware sample could commence. And really, the main goal today is to present these topics to you to kind of give you the foundations to become a proficient analyst of M1 malware. Obviously, though, this is somewhat the tip of the iceberg. I mean, an important tip, but nonetheless, there is you know, way more to dig into. So here's some resources if you're interested in learning more or kind of taking it to the next level. So first, uh, the Modern ARM Assembly Language Programming Book, really good resource if you really want to dig into the Eternals of uh, ARM64. Also, if you're interested in learning more about Mac malware in general, including you know, more anti-analysis stuff, more uh, dynamic analysis tools. Uh, I've written a book on the subject. It's free online, and you can check it out at taomm.org. Finally, if you're interested in macOS security topics, uh, we're hosting the fourth iteration of the Objective by the Sea macOS security conference uh, later this year, this fall in sunny Hawaii. You should definitely come. Before I end, I just want to thank some individuals and some organizations. First and foremost, I want to thank the Black Hat uh, Conference, the organizers, um, you know, especially this year with everything's going on. Thank you for, for hosting this and allowing me to speak. Also, thank you, the attendees, for tuning into my talk. I uh, really uh, appreciate that. And then finally, I also want to thank the amazing companies that support my independent research because without them, I wouldn't be here sharing this information with you today. So again, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for attending my talk and hope to see you all at Objective by the Sea in sunny Maui. Aloha.